Uh, thanks for coming along tonight at this busy time uh, where Alexandra Smith makes a welcome first appearance at the Sydney Institute on the occasion of the publication, the very recent publication of her book, The Secret by Alexandra Smith, the behind the scenes story of the mighty rise and shocking fall of Gladys Berejiklian. Now I introduce our speaker briefly, she's well known from newspapers of course, Alexandra Smith is the state political editor of the Sydney Morning Herald and has covered four state elections and several federal elections. She's also an award-winning journalist, including winning a Walkley Award, and she has worked for The Guardian London and is a regular political commentator on ABC Radio and TV and also president of the New South Wales Press Gallery. And today, I forget the topic, but it's about the book. <laughs> <laughs> so welcome. Thank you. Um, well, thanks for inviting me here tonight, and I'm really looking forward to an interesting discussion um, about Gladys Berejiklian um, and her contribution to public life and, of course, the Liberal Party. Um, I do think it's quite fitting that I'm at the Sydney Institute because many of you will probably remember that Gladys gave the dinner address in 2018 um, when she was Premier. And I think that was pr a really interesting time and moment for Gladys Berejiklian because um, she was finally convinced to talk up talk about herself a little, you know, open up about her family background. And indeed, as she tells the story, Jared encouraged her to do that. She wanted to talk in trademark Gladys way about uh, slightly less interesting things such as infrastructure and the economy and, <laughs> and boast about how New South Wales was doing. And Jared said to her, even by this audience standard, that may be a little boring. So he really encouraged her to open up and talk a little bit about her family and her background, which is such an important part of who she is. And for the first time that night in her speech, we heard about her background, um, her Armenian heritage, and she spoke about losing about 40 relatives in the 1915 genocide. Um, she spoke... Uh, lovely stories about her early days as a child starting school without speaking a word of English um, which is pretty incredible you know she went off as this little girl <coughs> terrified but from the beginning she worked so hard to learn English to catch up with all the other kids and she did it and that was the start of obviously a long life of I would say commitment dedication and real grit to succeed um, so I think speaking here tonight is very fitting given the Sydney Institute is in my book as is Jared um, and what I thought I might talk about is as I've been talking about the book and, and, and doing some talks to different groups I kind of get the same maybe three or four questions so I might beat you to those questions and <laughs> reflect on a few of those because I've come to think a little bit more about why people have asked these questions um, and and why certain things are in the book and why I approach things in a certain way. Um, the first question I get is, why does my book start with a quote from Khloe Kardashian? Now, I don't know if you if you all know who Khloe Kardashian is. She's part of the Kardashian family, which is America's most famous celebrity family. Um, up until last year, I think they had a very famous um, reality TV show called Keeping Up With The Kardashians. Khloe Kardashian has 271 million Instagram followers. I have 320. So it just gives you, you know, she is huge. And Gladys Berejiklian is a big fan of the Kardashians. She loved, and she, she makes no secret of really loving reality TV shows. We've all got our vices, that is hers. And I think, I always liked her talking about that because I think it really showed that a, a tiny glimpse into into her life that she didn't often share and that was just something that you know I, I can just imagine after working these long days um, in Macquarie Street or you know 52 Martin Place coming home and actually unwinding in front of a TV you know a show like that which is totally acceptable but there's another more significant reason about that quote and why the Kardashians and they are Armenian like Gladys is and they are very passionate about the Armenian cause as is Gladys Berejiklian and um in a, in a pretty remarkable way, they use their huge social media following. So there's several of them. There's Chloe and um, some others all starting with K. <laughs> um, clearly, I'm not a Keeping Up With The Kardashians fan, but I know who they are. Um, and um, they often use their huge social media following to really um, 
progress the Armenian cause, to talk about the events of the 1915 genocide, and also really support the um, Armenian diaspora, which is spread you know, all around the world. Um, so I think even though on a superficial level they're just a celebrity family who makes lots of money from being beautiful and you know having reality tv shows they actually do also use their big pool and their big social following to some good so um that is why that quote is in a, the start of a political biography um and it's probably the question i get asked the most because i suppose people you know unless you know the the background it probably seems somewhat strange but i thought it was a nice you know touch to sort of link Gladys to a couple of things in her in her life and in her story. The next most common question is, why did I write a book about Gladys Berejiklian? And the answer is really easy. And it's not because of her what went on in her private life. It's not because I thought there was some salacious tales to be told. It was very simple that I thought Gladys Berejiklian had an incredible story to tell, starting from those days of that little five-year-old going to North Ride Public when she couldn't speak a word of English, to rising all the way to, to the top, you know, to being the first popularly elected female premier. Um, and I think when you're in public life, it is you almost have an obligation or you have to accept that your moment in history is probably going to be documented and so it should be. Um, it won't surprise you that this is an unauthorised biography. Um, I did approach Gladys very early in the piece and asked her if she would like to talk. Um, of course, that was the appropriate and polite thing to do. Um, she was very, very kind back and said, thank you, but no thank you. And I, I, I totally understand that because it's not who she is. She's a very closed book and I'm sure she would feel deep uncomfortable about talking at length about herself. Um, her me then media director also advised her not to talk and suggested that perhaps maybe her friend shouldn't talk either. And while I understand why initially that was the view, it was, I, I feel a little misguided because that's just assuming that the interest is around the sort of salacious gossipy parts of what we all know came out. But as I say to people, um, Authors write books so that people will read them, buy them and enjoy them. Publishers publish books, obviously, so people buy them. Um, and nobody would have been interested in a salacious book about Gladys Berejiklian. What we know from her and from particularly her time through the black summer bushfires and then obviously the pandemic, people from all walks of life, from all political um, persuasions really loved Gladys Berejiklian. And I think it's incredible that when she left politics and had an independent commission against corruption inquiry into her, she was more popular then than she'd ever been throughout her leadership. So it really struck me that there was a big story to tell about Gladys Berejiklian. And I really felt that this time, at this point in history was the time to really look at state premiers. And I don't think it's any coincidence that on the same day my book was published, a book in... Um, Victoria was published on Dan Andrews. Now that's obviously to time time to come out before the a November election there. But I really think for the first time, probably in in living memory, state premiers have had such a big role in who we are, what we do, and that's because of the um, because of the pandemic. And you know, I always think about um, people who had no interest in politics, who were very disengaged. Gladys Berejiklian was beamed into their homes every day at 11 o'clock. She became a crucial part of our lives. Um, you know, it seems extraordinary now to think what back to March 2020, but it was a time of great fear. None of us knew what was happening. All we knew that this little known virus had made its way into Australia, into New South Wales, and it was increasingly impacting on our lives. And, you know, throughout that those early days, Gladys Berejiklian was a safe pair of hands. She led us through that with um, Kerry Chant, the Chief um, Health Officer, by her side. And I think it really lifted um, the lifted state premiers um, in the eyes of many people. You know, we've always used to the Prime Minister addressing the nation. You know, the Prime Minister is obviously, and still is, the most well-known public figure. But um, I think for the first time, as I said, in a long time, state premiers, particularly Dan Andrews and Gladys Berejiklian, really became important in, in, our, in our discourse and, and part of what we discussed. And so 
as much as I understood why initially Gladys was nervous about a book being written about her and some of her um, her closest people were, you know, urging her just to stay away from it and encourage other people to stay away from it. I'm really grateful and glad that as the process went on a little bit, a lot of her allies um, spoke to me for the book and they didn't do it out of disloyalty for Gladys even though she had sort of indicated she didn't want to be a part of the book. They did it because they realised that her story is a really important one to tell and what I find incredible what I found incredible, I suppose, in writing the book is even though I've probably known Gladys Berejiklian since 2007, when I first came back from overseas and I covered the 2007 state election, and obviously Gladys Berejiklian was in op opposition then, um, what I really found throughout the years is that she had an incredible way of engaging with people and really... Um, really a warm person who really, you know, um, sorry, who, who really kind of engaged with the broader community. And, but of course, a lot of what, what she did, we didn't know. And some, when I'm talking about what, what I'm talking about here is, even though I have covered so much of her career, there's a lot of incredibly important policies, particularly progressive social policies, that we didn't really hear a lot about, even though they were very prominent in, in the news cycle. And I guess one of those would be, um, and which was probably almost the most damaging to her leadership and also her you know, her standing in the party was the decriminalisation of abortion. And that was a really destabilising time in, in Gladys Berejiklian's leadership. Um, and it was a policy that divided the Liberal parties more than it divided any other party. Then It didn't divide the Nationals, it didn't really divide Labor, even though everybody was given a conscience vote. But it was hugely divisive for the Liberals. And at the time, I remember, and I covered this very extensively, I remember thinking, I wonder why Gladys isn't being more involved in this policy. I knew she was hugely supportive of it. I knew that she really wanted to see it pass Parliament without too much fuss, but she was very much on the sidelines. When it came to speak to the bill, she didn't speak. And when she came to vote on the bill, she slipped in quietly to Parliament, sat sort of with the, the eyes, but, you know, out of sight, off, off to the side and didn't make a fuss. And that's that was absolutely fine, although I remember at the time thinking, I wonder why as a female who really supports this, why isn't she being more uh, forthright and more open about her position? But when I was researching the book, what I discovered from um, Alex Greenwich, the Sydney MP, was that she was incredibly involved behind the scenes. She didn't need to be out in front of everybody trumpeting, um, you know, her views. She was a mentor to Alex Greenwich. She was there to, to basically give her wisdom and tell him how to shepherd through this difficult policy. And, but she didn't need to do it in any way that was overt or, you know, or um, of too obvious, probably because she was slightly concerned about some within her party, the right wing, were very, very angry with her for allowing this policy to come on before Parliament. And so I think she was probably concerned about that. But as Alex Greenwich explained to me, and I think it's really interesting, she just felt as leader, she didn't want to influence anybody. It was such a personal issue. Of course it was. And she was there to help Alex and guide him and, and make sure the policy got through. But it wasn't her job to actually stand up and be the, the, you know, the public face of it. And I think there are a lot of instances where we, I just, even though I've been covering Gladys since 2007, there's a lot of things that she really achieved that um, I wasn't aware of and I think a lot of people wouldn't have been aware of. And I think that's another reason why, to me, documenting her rise through her, you know, through from starting in Peter Collins' offices as a very junior, you know, electorate officer all the way through to being obviously in Barry O'Farrell's opposition, then his government, then being the first female treasurer, the first female transport um, minister, and then, of course, premier, um, is such, a, such an interesting story. Of course, we can't ignore the fact that her premiership ended because of a terrible decision she made. Now, um, I know Jared said, you know, no personal questions. Spoiler alert, there is nothing in this book that 
goes into Gladys's personal life beyond what was publicly revealed in the ICAC. Um, and I think because that's said enough, and, it, and Gladys's downfall and her story and her legacy isn't about the salacious details of a relationship she had with Daryl Maguire. But what it is about, it, it, it is part of her story because it, her decision, which she stuck to for many, many years, not to declare this relationship, um, was what finally brought her undone. And, of course, you know, a lot of people have spoken about everybody's had a Daryl, a lot of women have had a Daryl, you know, a dodgy boyfriend in their past, and, of course, we have. Um, but that's not what this is about and that's not what this book is designed to be about. But I don't think we can um, ignore the fact that it is part of her story and it is still incredible that it it happened how it did. And I remember, you know, so... Sh I, I remember when the um, witness list came out for Daryl Maguire um, in October 2022, I think it was, or just before that, and Gladys Berejiklian's name was on the list and we all thought there could be no more boring witness that would appear. We assumed, you know, of course, um, that nothing would, would come out other than Gladys Berejiklian talking about this former MP of hers who had a corruption cloud hanging over his head and he had to leave Parliament. In fact, she had to recruit Barrow Farrell to really push him out the door because he wanted to dig in and run as an independent. But, you know, she, she insisted he had to go. So, of course, when the witness list came out, nobody expected anything. And um, Gladys Berejiklian was up at 10am on a Monday and I was where all self-respecting political editors are in David Jones in the um, <laughs> um, unaware of what was about to unfold. And, of course, when it did, it was an incredible shock to, I think, everybody because, of course, nobody knew what, what that was coming, nobody suspected and nobody knew what this actually meant. And in the early, in the very early sort of hours after it broke, there was real fear within the Liberal Party that, well, within the Parliamentary Liberal Party, that Gladys Berejiklian wouldn't be able to survive this. But um, not only did she survive it, um, she went on to become more popular than she'd ever been that year from between, from the first revelations coming out about the relationship through to when ICAC revealed that it was actually investigating her, um, she had diff very difficult times, but it wasn't due to what had come out through ICAC. If you remember, that's when the Delta outbreak came. It was much trickier than the first um, the first outbreak. We had um, some really tough times in Sydney. And even though she probably wasn't quite as as lucky in that in that second round um because i think fatigue had started to set in and people were not perhaps as forgiving for mistakes and mistakes were made we can't um we can't ignore that i think the fact that gladys wouldn't meet with the 12 mayors who were really angry about the division within the city if you remember there were some uh, much harsher restrictions put on um <clears throat> put on parts of the Sydney and Gladys initially wouldn't meet with them. And I think, you know, it was a, a difficult time for her, but not because of what had happened at ICAC. It was because, um, of course, you know, if we thought we got through 2020 and that was our horror year, 2021 ended up, um, you know, almost worse, I would say. Um, so when I – coming back to why I wrote the book, I it, it was not in any way um, – to, do, to, to you know, focus on that. But we can't, we can't ignore the fact that that was a, a part of her story. And I think, um, you know, would Gladys Berejiklian still be Premier if that hadn't happened? Yes, absolutely she would be. And I think she would lead the coalition to the next election if that's what she wanted to do and would be very hard to beat. Um, but, of course, once she was subject to an ICAC inquiry, I think... Um, there is no way she would have been able to survive, not because she wasn't very popular with voters, but because she set the rules for her other ministerial colleagues and she expected them to abide to those, which meant she had to do the same. So I think ultimately there was no, no option there for um, Gladys, which takes me to the next question people ask. What do I think ICAC will find? And I always say that's not for me to comment on. Um, mm. I'm not, a, you know, I'm not a lawyer. It's not appropriate um, for me to to say or you know to preempt. But I what I will say is I am firmly of the view 
that Gladys Berejiklian should have declared that relationship because th there was potential for a conflict of interest and there would be no, th no nothing to lose through doing a declaration. Um, Mike Baird had to appear before ICAC, which was very difficult and very devastating for him because, of course, Gladys and Mike Baird were very close friends for a long, long time. He came into Parliament in 2007. She'd come in in 2003. They were very close throughout the sort of opposition days into Barry O'Farrell's first government. So I know he found it very difficult to have to go before ICAC and talk about his friend. But as he said in the ICAC, she could have come and just spoken to him about it confidentially you know of course people do not need to know about Gladys Berejiklian's private life or anybody's private life as long as it doesn't have any impact on their public life um, and so often people say to me but why did we need to talk about Gladys's private life why can't a politician have a private life of course anybody can and they deserve that but the rules are slightly different when you're in public life and so I maintain that Gladys had an obligation and should have um, declared that relationship. Whether that, how I can proceeds with that, I'm, that's not for me to comment. But what I will say is that I am still struck by how popular she was when she left um, Parliament. You know, to be to to go out essentially under a cloud of corruption, for want of a better term, but that's, you know, it was a corruption inquiry and still be incredibly popular. Having people send you flowers, people have never met you, urging you to stay and not to go. People, you know, being devastated that Gladys was no longer going to be their leader after what she'd taken us through. Um, I, I really think that unless there's an incredibly damning ICAC finding, um, I really believe that Gladys Sperger-Clinton could rise again in a federal um, capacity. I know she's gone off to the private sector and she says that's what she really wants to do now um, and I'm sure it's a great challenge and it's probably a good break from the grind of what she had to do. I mean, for two years from the Black Summer bushfires, which now seem like an eternity ago, to the pandemic and, of you know, it, I'm sure life in the corporate sector is probably quite nice for her. But Gladys is also hugely devoted to the Liberal Party and I think if the Liberal Party came to her and said we need you to win back a seat such as North Sydney, um, I really wonder whether she would be able to turn that down. I mean of course she may be completely done and I can't speak for her but my takeaway thought is that this, unless there is an absolute hugely damning finding about from the ICAC about Gladys, um, this doesn't need to be the end of her politically. Um, I don't think, of course, she could have run in the May federal election for in Moringa. It was too soon, and I think, you know, it would be it would defeat the purpose of her leaving state parliament if she then just ran federally. Um, it was still too soon, and I think it also would undermine the integrity agency. I know there's a lot of debate around whether the ICAC is appropriate, whether it sets out to do, or whether it does what it was set out to do. But regardless, I think, you know. Warringah was never an option, really, despite um, some people thinking that perhaps it would be a great idea, and I'm sure it would have possibly been a great idea. But I think further down the track, um, there's a good chance we could see her rise again. And I also think perhaps, and I, I think this is quite interesting, we could see quite a contingent of New South Wales MPs in federal parliament as part of rebuilding the Liberal Party. And I think Mike Baird could be another option who... He has said, I remember I interviewed him when he first got the Hammond care job and he said, never say never, 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 never. And I thought, <laughs> how you know, to me that was, yeah, maybe. Um, so I think he might be an option. I think Andrew Constance will run again in Gilmore. Um, of course, Matt Keane, I think, has his eyes on um, federal politics. So it's quite interesting that perhaps the future of rebuilding, to some degree, the Liberal Party... Um, may well lie with the likes of some pretty popular premiers, Mike Baird and Gladys Berejiklian. So I'm happy to... Is that OK with you, Jerry? Fine. Yeah. Well, many thanks to Alexandra Smith. And, of course, the topic was reflections on Premier Gladys Berejiklian, which is exactly what we heard. As I said earlier, we've got copies of The Secret, available for sale after the event and also for people who are on our Zoom and otherwise going to watch this on, on footage. Um, and Dan will be 
We're getting these books signed and they'll be online. So we come to questions and discussion. Um, I'll be working this part of the room and I'll be working that mm. part of the room. So if I just hang on one second. Um, can I take you back to your, just come up here mm -hmm. and, and just like you were speaking. Yeah. Uh, take you back to your comment that um, once uh, Gladys Berejiklian uh, hadn't lived up to her own requirements about declarations, mm -hmm. she had to step down, and I understand that. But I think there's a rather naive view among, in certain legal circles, that someone who's named by ICAC doesn't have to stand down. You take Stephen Charles QC, who's a very prominent and distinguished uh, Victorian lawyer who's backing this. In his book, Stephen Charles says about Gladys Berejiklian and the others, Nick Greiner and, uh, and Barry O'Farrell, that they didn't have to stand down once they were named, once there was an inquiry about ICAC. It seems to me this is an incredibly unrealistic view that lawyers take. If you're in politics, and what Gladys Berejiklian was announced, what, last November, mm. uh, there was an inquiry. The idea that she should have hung around till now, which we're in, what, September, it's still not out, mm. that, a, that a party could carry a leader, a premier, who's under investigation by IPAC, seems to me to be totally unrealistic. What's your position on that? Yeah, I, I agree. I think it is totally unrealistic. And, of course, from a legal perspective, there is no legal reason um, to stand down, so I can I, I can see why you know lawyers may well say that, um, but you're right. You can imagine going into particularly this state election, which is going to be incredibly tight. Um, you know, I'm hearing some pretty incredible internal polling, both out of the Liberals and Labor, and if it's accurate, and I know we're six months out, and that's always just a snapshot in time, but the coalition isn't in a strong position at the moment, and perhaps that would have been different if. I mean, of course, I think it would have been different if, if Gladys Berejiklian hadn't gone. But equally, it is a government approaching its 12 years. Um, it's asking for another four years. And politically, you're absolutely right. The idea that, um, you know, you could carry a leader, which just opens up, um, the op you know, gives the opposition just free ammunition repeatedly to talk about a corruption cloud. And that's, you know, hanging over a leader is just um, not feasible. And I might just say, if you don't mind, Jared, um, when I spoke to Barry O'Farrell for the book from India, where he's still the High Commissioner, um, he said to me, you know, I could have, I didn't have to go over that bottle of wine, but I'd spent 16 years in opposition attacking Labor mm. for a lack of integrity. I wasn't going to give them the satisfaction and the ability to attack me in return. So he was very aware that if he remained, it would it would be, you know, un, un, unfeasible, in, you know, in the longer term. Thanks for that. So there's a question down here. Thank you, Alex. Um, do you think that the way that Gladys was treated publicly by the media uh, and various other commentators has created a deterrent for people to enter public life? Uh, and if so, do you think that Australia as a, as a society needs to be a little bit fairer um, on, our, on our public figures, um, particularly for those who make such a great sacrifice to enter public life? I don't know. When you say treated unfairly, is that because the issues were covered? I mean, there is no way they could be ignored. Um, I don't think the Gladys Berejiklian situation um, is what's stopping women entering um, politics. If that, you know, that, of course, I, you know, somebody like Gladys Berejiklian really had the ability, and I actually think this is one failing of her, and I've written about this a lot, to not promote women and encourage more women into politics. So I think she had a great platform to do that. And we saw what happened to the Liberal Party federally when you don't have enough women running and women aren't encouraged to run. So I think that was a big missed opportunity for her. I understand that she, I completely understand that her position was she just wanted to be remembered as a Premier, not a female Premier, that she didn't believe in quotas. <laughs> but I do think, you know, she had a unique position to really encourage women into public life. So I don't think the coverage of Gladys Berejiklian or, you know, any commentary around her, her situation is what would stop people coming into public life. I think um, parties need, and the way pre-selections are run, and I mean, we could talk about this all night, but I think there's a lot of other barriers. Um, and, you know, this, I guess I get a little frustrated because people like to seize on this idea that we're all gossiping about Gladys's private life. And I understand, you know, some pretty interesting, I've got a 
be realistic. Some pretty interesting bits of information came out through phone taps um, at ICAC and, you know, that's, that is the reality. But it wasn't about Gladys's private life. I mean, you know, it wasn't the little bits of pieces that we wanted to talk about. At the end of the day, she was the most... Um, you know, she was the top elected official in our state and, and you have to hold yourself to, a, you know, a standard above other people and that includes ensuring there are no conflicts of interest, ensuring um, there's transparency and, you know, I think um, there are a lot of reasons we could talk again about this forever and there's a lot of reasons why that relationship wasn't declared and I think it was probably her strong commitment to her Armenian community and perhaps the feeling that Daryl Malai wasn't the right person for her um, perhaps she was worried her colleagues would not approve. There's probably, and I don't want to speak for her. I don't know, um, but I, like I said, I'm firmly of the belief that relationship needed when you're when you're the premier, you can't take any chances, and that relationship needed to be declared. Um, and I think the coverage of it had to. I think it was largely fair. I mean, I'm sure she didn't like it. Gladys was no fan of the media. Um, she was in opposition. She courted the media and she was very good at it. But as she rose up through the ranks, she was certainly no fan of the media. Um, and I'm sure she wasn't happy with the coverage. Um, but I don't think that's what stops people, all women, going into public life. Thank you. I'm a great fan of hers. Sorry. I'm a great fan of hers. Okay. Like a nice cream. Okay. You eat the ice cream. Hopefully not. Um, I'm a great fan of hers. My question is, um, if she had been a man, would there have been a different, potentially a different outcome? I'd, you can't help not thinking that. Do you know what? I think, and perhaps you won't agree with me, but I think if she'd been a man, she wouldn't have survived as long. I think she was able to garner sympathy. So many women. I, I couldn't believe the number of women who had such a sympathetic view to Gladys. This idea, this line, and I know it's a cliche now, but you know, everyone's had a Daryl. Everyone's dated a dud. And I think I really don't think a man would have been able to survive because I think so many... I, I think Gladys had this um, has this persona of being, you know, very calm, very kind, very, you know, very nurturing, a very nice person. And I think people felt terrible for her that she had to go through this in such a publicly humiliating way. It must have been hideous for her. But I don't know if a man would have garnered the same sympathy. Somebody said to me, and I won't say who, but he may be the Premier, that um, if he, if this had been him, he probably would have had to resign on the steps of ICAC the, on the first day. And maybe that's a bit of an exaggeration, but I tend to wonder, would have we put up with a man having, you know, a secret affair with the wrong woman? I don't think we would have. Yeah, just a, a point that, that you're innocent till you get it witness or investigator by ICAC, I mean, is there a better structure, in your opinion, Alexandria, for... For the ICAC? I think, I do think there is clearly a problem with um, public hearings. And I was interested, um, an interview, I think it was done just after um, Gladys appeared for the second time at ICAC with um, Nick Griner, who was obviously the architect of the ICAC. And, you know, he, and of course, as we mentioned, he, he, um, the irony is, of course, he set it up and then that brought down his political career. And he said that he believed that although obviously the agency was set up on a model based in Hong Kong and, and at best practice at that time, they probably got a few things wrong. And I think perhaps, you know, public hearings are um, difficult because they don't have the same um, evidence. There's no, not the same laws of evidence as you would in a court. Um, I'm not a lawyer. I'm, I don't want to try and propose a, a better model, but I can see that um, while I really believe we need strong in, um, integrity agencies, particularly I think at a state level because, um, and Jared and I were talking about this earlier, you know, we have seen many, many problems with local government and I think there really needs to be that sort of, um, that sort of body to oversee you know, developments and, and that sort of thing in local government. Whether it can be fine-tuned um, more broadly, probably. And I think another problem that the ICAC faces, and this is very much what happened in the um, Gladys Berejiklian case, people see corruption, understandably, as, you know, wads of cash being handed out in brown paper bags. And they were like, well, Gladys was not on the take. But, of course, the ICAC Act goes much broader than that, and it looks at... 
um, you know, public officials, their role in ensuring um, they don't lose, you know, don't lose trust. Um, <clears throat> that they're, and so I think there's a lot of misunderstanding also about what the ICAC does and that's where I think people were very confused. You know, Gladys was such an upstanding citizen and a leader and was always open with the public. How could she possibly be corrupt? Um, but under the ICAC Act, Act, as it stands, you know, corruption is much broader than just um, kind of hourly bags of cash, which is obviously a far more clear-cut um, corruption case, if we remember that, involving Labor. Uh, one of the arguments put forward for a federal ICAC is that it'll restore trust. In New South Wales, we've had an ICAC for an, in excess of three decades. And given the post-2011 uh, election revelations about what happened during the Carr um, you know, po and Labor government about corruption, do you consider that there's a higher level of trust about New South Wales government than there is about federal government? Well, I definitely don't think New South Wales, the government will come up against the same concerns around integrity at the state election because probably of, you know, such things as the ICAC. I know um, and I understand a lot of Liberals see that uh, Griner and O'Farrell were brought down by the ICAC, but let's not forget uh, they came down pretty hard on Obeid. I mean, he is in jail in McDonald. After his government left office. That's right. Yeah. That's right. True. But it, I mean, nonetheless, it, it it was it has played an important role, and I, I I really don't think I mean New South Wales is in a really unique position. It's very different to its federal colleagues. It has an integrity agency, and I think a lot of people feel that while it doesn't always get it right, it's better than not having one. Um, and also New South Wales under, um, you know, Matt Keane, but also the Nationals, which I always thought was pretty extraordinary, has a really strong climate policy. So New South Wales will, is, will go into the 2023 election in a very different position to its federal colleagues, you know, although I do think that there's been significant brand damage because of the federal Liberals. When you look at the uh, opening statement by the council assisting... Uh, ICAC, the allegations against Berejiklian weren't particularly complex uh, relating to whether she should declare her interest uh, under the Ministerial Code of Conduct. Mm -hmm. Now, Ruth McColl has been given an extension of time till October mm -hmm. to uh, bring down her report. Had she still been on the Supreme Court and it, there'd be some criticism of reserving for such a length of time. Uh, do you think this should be a requirement, as the Legislative Council unanimously mm -hmm. voted for, that there be a time limit on ICAC once they've finished their investigations to bring down a report in a timely manner? I think there has to be not only a report, a time limit around a report, but we look at the situation of John Sedoti, where he had to remove himself from the Cabinet. He was on the crossbench, I think, for about 18 months before public hearings were even started. So I think absolutely there needs to be um, some legislated time um, frames, I think, uh, around reports. Um, you know, I th the Chinese Friends of Labor, it was a very big... Uh, investigation, but it still took two years, and you know, lives, people's lives are on hold, their careers are on hold. Um, so I definitely think that ICAC is too slow, um, and I think there's definitely that upper house inquiry. I think was very important that report um, because I think something really needs to be done. Just before we move to this question, why is ICAC so slow? Why does it take this sort of body so long to come to decisions that other institutions could make? within a day or within a week or at least within a month? It's a secret. Yeah, um, I mean, in um, budget estimates, the former um, chief commissioner, who's now moved on, but Peter Hall, acknowledged it was too slow, but I don't think we've ever really understood why. Um, of course, you know, the ICAC has been in in constant kind of conflict, I suppose, with various premiers or premier office premiers offices around funding. The funding model is probably a problem. Um, the the way it's set up, there is no independent funding. Um, the ICAC gets money through the budgetary process each year, but also does have to go kind of cap in hand to the premier's office to um, 
to ask for more funding when, you know, they have a particularly complex investigation they need to do. It was quite interesting. The reason Ruth McColl oversaw that inquiry as a temporary commissioner was so that there was no conflict of interest around the funding model, around, sorry, around the funding request that had gone through Berejik Clean's office when she was Premier. So I think perhaps um, that must play a part because that is the main criticism that commissioners always have of their lack of sort of funding and their lack of access to funding without, like I said, having to go to the Premier's office and ask for a top-up all the time, which is less than ideal. Uh, Alex, um, it's, a slight, it's a slight digression, yeah. but it, it's all relative. relative. The, the Teals um, won the last, or attacked the Liberals in the last federal election based on three issues. One was corruption, and getting an ICAC. Mm. Two was climate change, and I think three was basically women mm. in parliament. Um, at the state level, and there's all this talk that they're going to take on the Liberals again, mm. do you think they'll have the same effect when we've got an ICAC, mm. when climate change has been resolved nationally and it's not a state, really mm. a state issue? And I think we've got a pretty good number of female... Have we got a no. number of... No. No. Well, they might be able to get up on that, but do you think they'll have the same effect? No, I don't. I don't. For a few reasons, for those reasons that you mentioned. Um, I also don't think there is the same level of probably anger at yes. this government. That's not to say um, that I think that the coalition will win, but I think there's, if anything, there's fatigue. Um, you know, I think it gets to a point where people think this government's been in 12 years, you know, is it time? I, I do still think that um, whether they're teal candidates, I'm not sure if Simon Holmes Court will actually back them in, but um, I do think you'll probably see some teal-like candidates running in some of these um, North Shore seats. I think you'll probably see one in Gladys Berejiklian's yeah, former yeah. seat at Willoughby. Um, of course, when she, she, she took over that, when she won that seat, she won it by 144 votes. By the time she left Parliament, I think it was on a margin of about something incredible, 24%. Um, it's now marginal again. Um, when it was run, it, when Tim James um, in, uh, ran. And of course, you know, you always get a swing against the government in a by-election. Often, you know, you loop, they lose them. Um, but I think a seat like Willoughby, um, maybe North Shore, um, might see a teal, and there's also talk about seats like Pitwater if Rob Stokes yeah, does. Stokes. Yeah, yeah. I think Stokes might go. To okay, sorry. <laughs> no, can't have two questions here. Well, they've got to pick it up. Okay. Yes, sorry, I go back to the uh, ARCAC again. The, um, when that testimony uh, started, they actually uh, the, the city is still under lockdown. So I was kind of very uh, bored, you know, so that's why I uh, ABC broadcasted it to us. Um, um, testimony. And um, I just have a bit of problem. Um, I mean, a lot of things they're talking about are just legal jargon, but I just have a, a particular um, the, the choice of the language she used mm. in one of the testimony really um, surprised me. Because when her boyfriend asked for more money and uh, for to funding for the election, and, she, and her answer is, you know, uh, don't worry about it, I'm going to shower you uh, with money. So that choice of language, to me, it didn't reflect well on the, 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 the character of that, of that presence. Mm. Um, I think, obviously, what you're referring to is, um, you know, Paul Barley. And, and you're right, in ICAC, Gladys Berejiklian was very sort of um, open about Paul Barley and said, you know what, yes, we, curry f we, we do it, we curry favour with voters to win seats. It happens all the time. You mightn't like, but that's the way it is. And I think it did surprise some of her colleagues, I must say, um, and there's a whole section in the book about this, where she really doubled down on that. Um, and she really, and she sort of said very publicly, and this was in relation to a, a quite a controversial um, scheme where uh, the coalition handed out money um, large to the bulk of, of um, Liberal seats and, and some Nat seats um, for projects um, under the guise of, because they were um, amalgamated under the council amalgamation policy, but of course some weren't. And you know we had incidences like you know Hornsby Council getting a huge amount of money without any obvious need or at least any of following the process. And I think it surprised a lot of people that Gladys Berejiklian took a very kind of cavalier approach to pork barrelling and suggested that sure might 
be a bit icky and people don't really like the concept, but so be it. And I would like to add, I think this is quite interesting and I don't know what this means, but I think it means something. The ICAC then held a, for want of a better term, I suppose, round table. I think it was earlier this year with some sort of esteemed legal minds, some academics to talk about whether the practice of pork barrelling could be uh, deemed as corruption under the ICAC Act. For the first time in its history, to your point, Jared, about why is it slow, the ICAC turned a report around that incredibly quickly to say, yes, they think at times pork barrelling could be um, deemed as corruption. I don't know why in this one instance they did that, but I think... I think there's something interesting that may emerge from that. And I'm, I'm not making any assumptions or predictions, but it did strike me as very interesting that that, that report seemingly happened very quickly. <laughs> All right, here we go, down the back. Okay. Thanks, Alexandra. Uh, we've heard tonight about some problem, potential problems with the ICAC system. So we've got a commission with, that is commissioned to investigate a very broad concept of what corruption is. Mm. They've got quite incredible powers. They're not bound by normal rules of evidence. They take a really long time to deliver their judgments and any uh, investigation attracts incredible media attention. So my question is, if one day your career took a different turn, you went into politics and you found yourself the subject of an ICAC investigation, would you be confident that you would be treated fairly? Oh. <laughs> Um, I think, I, I, I guess the simplest way I could answer that is probably yes. I do understand that there have been cases, you know, include particularly involving liberals where uh, they, um, you know, you, you may have, they may have felt poorly treated. But, I mean, I guess at the same time there have been plenty of, Plenty of cases, and there's so many that goes unnoticed because they're just not simply not interesting enough to the broader public. And you know, people like me no longer have the sort of as much time or space to devote to them. But there, uh, there are a lot of ooh, sort of low level public um, local government, you know, really serious corruption going on in in local government, and that you know that is that's still elected officials spending ratepayers' money. Um, it's no less important. It's probably less high profile. But I think that while there are many critis, critics of um, ICAC and, you know, John Sedoti is a very vocal one because he felt he was very much poorly treated and even though the ICAC handed down a, a finding of um, serious corrupt conduct, he, he, he doesn't accept that and, and is challenging it through the Supreme Court. But my short answer is yes, I think I would assume that I'd be treated um, fairly but I can absolutely guarantee you I would never go into politics, so <laughs> I don't really have to worry too much. I admire your faith in ICAC, but I frankly have none. When I see the way Margaret Kaneem was treated and a former police minister and others who have been found completely innocent later on, ICAC even maintains a lot of that garbage on their website and they don't take it off. Mm. And I think, frankly, I'm against corruption, but I think ICAC is a bigger threat than uh, some of this corruption that's going on. Um, <laughs> well, you know, I, I guess my response to that would be I can understand that there, there, there are certain, like, ICAC has certainly got it wrong and Mike Gallagher is one example, Margaret Kinnean, Um But I just would say, well, what's the alternative if we don't have an, an integrity agency? Um, you know, I think we absolutely do have to have a body where that can investigate MPs because, or, or you know, councillors. Um, there is nothing else exists. Police. Oh. The police. I mean, the police. Uh, that's you know, we're just something's either legal or it's not, and there's much you know, things are much more grey than that. Yes. Um, I'm going to go here then. There. there. <coughs> uh, just on, hang on, just on the issue of corruption. Mm. Um, I, I thought, that in, 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 as you know, it's in the final chapters of your book. It seemed to me that Gladys Berejiklian Glenn's been one of the most honest politicians. She actually said, well, if we get elected, we make promises, we give money. If you go to I said this Wagga hospital, that was one of the yeah. funding issues. I mean, is anyone saying that Wagga didn't deserve extra funding from its hospital? Was anyone in the state of New South Wales saying that that money shouldn't have gone to Wagga Hospital? I, Wagga Hospital wasn't one that sort of featured so much in 
in the pork barrelling side of things, I think the reason Wagga Hospital um, was got so much attention was just the language around um, the you know, language used between Gladys and Daryl in terms of whether there was a conflict of interest. That was used to highlight whether he had a sort of access that other people didn't have to her and whether she could make things happen that other pe- for him that maybe other people um, couldn't. I think a bigger example was just the overwhelming spend on the Wagga Wagga by-election when, when Daryl Maguire left. $140 million was committed to that by-election, which is pretty extraordinary money. Um, why didn't that, why was that not needed prior to the election? You know, um, surely if you require certain things to be upgraded or certain funding, it's not just needed when you're trying to hold a seat. I guess I just wanted to say there must be a better way than putting people on the stand publicly before anyone knows that they're guilty. I mean, when the police charge someone, usually they've had an investigation and usually we don't know what that investigation entails. So uh, uh, the police have to be sure that they've got a reasonable amount of evidence before that person goes into a public place and is reported on by journalists. But what happens with ICAC is that with no one knowing what anything about the investigation, they have the investigation in front of the public on a public stand. And it seems to me that no one can survive ICAC because they're damned before they even set foot well, inside. And right. that, to me, is the flaw with ICAC. Well, I don't think that whole And these are people, as the young woman down the back said, who don't even use the usual rules of evidence. Mm. I don't think any public inquiry goes ahead. I mean, not every ICAC investigation goes to a public inquiry. I mean, they do do investigations and then just put out a report and find Yeah, but all the ones that have been found to be most ridiculous, like Barry O'Farrell, Nick Greiner, and this one may end up the same way, have always caused the greatest <coughs> amount of public interest and the people involved who are accused end up being OK at the end of it, but they've had to ruin their careers in the process. Mm. So, I think in my mind, what we're doing is we've got a sort of village stocks and every now and then a group of people who've been appointed by the government and whom the government is now so scared of they can't do anything to reform it um, we pop those people in the stocks and we all throw stuff at them and that's the end of it. Well, they did reform. I'm not trying to be a... I'm, I don't mean to sound like, you know, just a... No. Uh, but the government did reform it to the three-commissioner model after um, the Canine... That's changed. Um, no, but I think... it was. It's interesting. I will say that Dominic Perrottet is very supportive of the ICAC. And when Scott, when Scott Morrison was criticising it, and I think obviously that was, you know, for a political reason, um, he was... Perite stood up each time and said, you know, I really back in our ICAC, um, you know, and I really think it's important to our democracy. Okay, we've got two questions to go. We're going to go here, we're going to go there. Okay. Put it right up here. Yeah. Well, just in quick, uh, relating to the fairness of it, mm -hmm. uh, there was a large amount of evidence given in private, uh, and that evidence was given in public, but a, a lot of it, there was no dispute in relation to it. And normally you would simply have an agreed set of facts. I mean, there was no need to trawl through this. And as you mentioned in your book, there was a telephone intercept with a highly embarrassing, as you know, private conversation between Maguire and Berejiklian uh, that was totally irrelevant. And yet that was stayed up on their website for half an hour. Mm. And there might have been a suppression, or a suppression order but that doesn't prevent it being distributed very widely in private conversations. And that was by a junior officer, and mm. that, that was seen to me to be totally unacceptable. Mm. Um, there was a, a Bruce McClintock SC did a do, he, in the inspector of the ICAC, he's, yeah. he's now moved on from that role. He did do an investigation into that and, and was pretty reported confident, on. reported on it, was pretty confident that it wasn't a deliberate um, deliberate act. I mean, initially when it first happened, there was a lot of concern that it was, you know, a, a deliberately um, done. I will say, um, not. I know none of you will want me to defend the media, but nobody did the wrong, nobody in the media no. did the wrong thing with that um, transcript. Um, th then, of course, it landed in the hands of Mark Latham, who is a very smart political operator, and he knew exactly what to do to be able to get it out in the open and, of course, use parliamentary privilege, which is... Entirely, he's right. We've got to be a very quick final question. 
What are the family circumstances of Julie Gillard, Gladys Berejiklian and Anastasia Palaszczuk say about the sacrifices that a woman has to make to get to the top in Australian politics? But men don't have to, mm. apparently. I think it says a lot. I think this is what I mean. It, um, politics has to be more more uh, family friendly. And when I say that, you know, why? how could you go into politics as a sort of a younger woman hoping to have a family one day, knowing that if you wanted to be a federal member, you'd be travelling to Canberra, leaving your family behind. At the moment, it's a really... Like, there are so many barriers for women um, that I really think, you know, there is no doubt in my mind that... Gladys Berejiklian was so committed to public service that she gave up on, you know, love and, you know, having children so that she could give everything to public life. And that's probably why she was so successful. Um, that's not to say fathers can't take a big role in in being the ca primary caregiver. For, so women can go into politics, but I still think there are many barriers and until that's rectified in, across all parties particularly the Liberal Party, though, in, and, and the way in which pre-selections happen is another big issue because that starts the process where it's very hard to convince people to run. I think there's still going to be a really big under-representation of women in public life. Okay, many thanks. Um, so we ended up back where we started on the personality of Gladys Berejiklian, which is what The Secret's all about. It's a terrific read. I only got it today, but I've already read a fair bit of it. Um, so, as I said, there are copies of it available, and our speaker will sign it. Uh, thanks for a stimulating discussion and a good paper and stimulating question time. Many thanks. Well done. Good luck.